Hey everyone and welcome back. In this video we'll be adding some extra content to the line trace functionality we had and also some interactivity. So to begin with I just want to create the new blueprint class which will be our interactive object. So if we go back to the blueprints folder we'll right click in here and we'll create the blueprint class. It's just going to be a simple actor class for this and we're going to call this bp underscore interactive base. So this is going to act as our parent class and if you're not familiar with this uh, it just means that we're going to be making other objects which will be a child or a class based off of this base class. So any functions or variables that we put in the base class will be available to the children. And this will definitely become a lot more obvious as we go through this. Uh, but to begin with, inside of this, I just want to create a simple function. So we're gonna create a function here, and we're gonna call this activate. So that's really all this class needs at the moment. And just before we get back into the player class, I'm gonna get a few things ready for the child class that we'll be making. So we're going to be interacting with something, but I want to create that as and when we're going to use it. Before we create that class though, I'm just going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this assets. And inside of this, I'm going to create another folder called meshes. Now inside of the meshes folder, I'm just going to put the uh, the first object that we make is going to be a spinning cube. So to get this, I'm going to drag in a cube from the side panel. This is just the way I like to get assets in my project. For prototyping and things, it just saves exporting them from Blender and setting up UVs and things. So we can come in, we can drag one of these template cubes, we can right click on this and we'll convert the cube to a static mesh. We'll put this inside of the meshes folder and we'll call this cube. So that just gives us a cube ready to use with the UVs and everything set preset for it, which is perfect. So now if we go back to the blueprints folder, we'll go to the BP underscore player base and we can see we already had our line trace forward and this is what we're going to be building upon. So the first thing we need to do is we're going to create a new function and I'm just going to call this the basic gaze. So this is going to be continuing on our gaze functionality and this is going to be the very basic implementation where as soon as you look at something it's going to do something. The way this is going to work is we can actually remove the line trace forward and we can drag in the basic gaze. Inside of the basic gaze we're going to use this function that we've set up and we're actually going to take the variables from the out hit. So we can plug this in here. Now looking at the way that we will be using this we could probably turn this into a pure function. Uh, it just means that I think it has slightly less overhead and this still gives us the option that we can come in here and we can pull off and break the hit result which is really the only thing that we need. Now the first thing we want to do from here uh, because we don't have the execution pin from the line trace forward anymore is we're going to use a branch node. So we want to do a quick check from our branch whether or not we've actually hit something. So we're just going to check whether something is being looked at. Now if it is then we want to check what that object is. So we'll get the hit actor and we're going to do a cast to our interactive base. So we'll cast to BP interactive base. Now the way this is going to work is because of how the inheritance works in programming, anything which, any classes which we will be creating which will be a child of the interactive base will also return true when cast against the interactive base. So this is just going to save us casting against multiple different checks. Uh, we can just do this one check and as long as it is a child of the interactive base then we know we want to interact with it in some way. Now if this is true, so if this hits something which is the interactive base class, I'm going to pull off of here, I'm going to promote this to a variable and we'll call this the interactive object. So this is just going to be a reference to the object that we might want to interact with. Now I'm going to set something up ahead of time as well. So we're going to do a quick branch check off of this uh, once we've set this to a variable. So when this is filled with something, we want to check whether or not the interactive object is equal to another object. So I'm going to plug this in here. And the other object we want to check against is going to need to be the same type. So it's going to be an interactive base class. Uh, reference. So we can come over here, we can control W and copy this and I'm going to call this one the focused object. So this is actually going to keep track of the very last object that we looked at. So if we control drag this back in and we're going to check whether or not the current interactive object is equal to the most recently focused object. Now if that is false, so if that's not the case, then we want to update what the focused object is. So we will alt drag in the focused object and we will make that the interactive object there. And there's one more thing we need to do off of this pin, but before we get there, I'm just gonna tidy this up and move on back over to our branch over here. Uh, and in fact, our cast too as well. So failing this, if we are not looking at anything, so if we haven't hit anything, which means we're probably looking at the sky or the object is slightly out of range because remember, we've given ourselves a fairly limiting range. So if this is the case, then we're gonna come in and we're gonna set the interactive object back to nothing. 
So we'll reset this to have nothing stored in it. And if we compile, remember that this is how this starts, so it'll be filled with none. And we're also going to reset the focused object back to nothing. And if we just drag this over, we can do the same thing. If the object that we are hitting, so if we're hitting something like the floor or a wall, uh, then it's not going to return true on the cast here. So we also want to return the most recently looked at object back to nothing. Now, when that's done, that's pretty much this function finished. So we're going to create another function here. And this is just a fail safe that I found that um, I kind of needed for some reason. I'll explain why in just a moment. But if we create a new function and we'll call this interact. Now inside of the interact function, this is like I said, just a fail safe really. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to get the interactive object and we're going to say, uh, do a check whether or not this is valid. So we'll do an is valid check. And if it is, then we want to get the current object and we want to activate it. Okay, so nice and simple. And we'll save this. And the reason that I found that I needed this is although we're doing all of these checks here, I thought this would have been enough uh, because we're checking whether or not we've hit something. We're also casting it and setting the variables and resetting them. I think because you can gaze at and look away at something a little bit too quickly sometimes for it to uh, recognize, it kind of falls through these checks. So just calling this function and doing one final check stops you getting any null references or non-existent object errors returned. So back in the basic gaze function, once we've done all of this, once we've set everything and we have our focused object, we are going to pull off of here and call the interact function. So that is now ready to go. I'm going to compile this and I will now return back to the blueprints folder because this is where we're going to make the object that we're going to be interacting with. So if we grab our interactive base class, we can right click on this and we'll create a child blueprint class. I'll call this the interactive cube and inside of here I'm just going to come in and add a static mesh and I'll fill this with the cube that we have from earlier. And then the other thing I want to add in here is a rotating movement component. So we'll get the rotating movement, we'll just simulate to see what this is going to look like. So that's what we'll expect it to be doing during play. With the rotating movement component selected though, we're going to come over to the rotation rate and zero this out. So when it starts play, nothing should be rotating. And we're going to have control over this inside of the event graph. So keeping in mind that this is a child of the BP interactive base, that means we have access to the function that we made there. So if we go to the functions, we'll go to override and get the activate function. This will create a node, um, a, an event, a custom event for us called activate. And basically, whenever this is called, this is going to filter down into this class and we can use it here. So it means that we can have this one function in multiple classes and they can all do different things, which makes this very, very easy and very quick to prototype with. So all we want this to do is when this is called, we want to get the rotating movement and we want to set the rotation rate. We can plug this straight into the activate function and we can pull off of here and we can do this based on a select node. So we can change the wildcard to a Boolean and we'll promote this to a variable. Now all we want this variable to do is we're going to toggle this and we're going to say that if it should rotate then we will set this to be the 180 degrees or the, the rotation rate of 180 on the z-axis and otherwise we're going to set this back to zero which is false. And quite simply now that we've got this variable we should probably name it so we'll go and we'll call this b should rotate and as soon as this function is called I'm going to come in, drag this in, we can alt drag the should rotate in and we'll set this to be the negative of itself. So if we get the reference to this again, pull off of here, get a not boolean and we're going to set the current should rotate to whatever the uh, should rotate currently isn't. So uh, if that is a bit confusing, it's just going to set if, if it checks this and the should rotate is set to false, then the not of that is true. So it's going to set this back to true and vice versa if it's true it's going to set it to false. So it's kind of like a flip-flop, uh, but it just kind of automatically then controls itself and manages its own state. So now what we should find is if we place this into the world, we can just drag this in, make sure that we saved everything, place this off to the side. And now if we come in and look at the cube, the first time we look at this, uh, we're not getting any collision. So when we bring in a new cube like this, just going to exit back out, go back to the meshes. Uh, we could see that we were actually scanning in the background, so it was definitely reaching past the cube, but it wasn't... Uh, tracing onto the cube itself. So I think that's just because we've made the mesh the way that we did. We can come in here, add collision, and give this a, a box simplified collision. Close these other tabs because that might be what's making my PC go super slow. And then we'll press play again, come in, and now we should see the first time we look at it, it starts rotating. And then if we look at it again, it will stop rotating. And we can toggle this on and off. And if your PC isn't lagging as much as mine, then that should look pretty cool. 
So that is the basic gaze functionality setup. This is, like I said, this is just a very instant, uh, very instantaneous kind of effect that we're going for here. Now we can also use this to very quickly create our teleport pad. Like I mentioned, this is a very versatile way to use the, the blueprints is using the inheritance system. So if we go back to the interactive base, we can create another blueprint child. I'll call this one the interactive uh, teleport pad. This one's slightly more complex, but it won't take much longer. So if we go into the event graph again, uh, we can come in here. We want to call the parent event begin play to let it do its thing. Uh, we don't really need the overlap or the tick, but on begin play, we want to get the current player pawn and we want to cast that to our player class, so the BP player base. And we're going to store that to a reference. We'll just call that, uh, we'll promote this to a variable and call it player. And the reason being is we're going to come back over to the functions, we'll get the override. We'll get our activate override so we create another custom event down here and all we want to do there's actually a built-in function in unreal which i only found out about recently called teleport which is like great that this is already for us um, otherwise i'd actually be making my own teleport functions uh, manually and that just saves us doing that so all we want to do is we want to get the player and we want to set the uh, the target is the player so it's going to do the thing to the target which is teleporting the uh, destination or the dest location is going to be get actor location so that's just where the teleport pad is uh, i find that if we add a vector here so vector plus vector we'll add say 50 units to the z axis so that we're not going to put the player in the floor and we'll set that to be the location and then we want the rotation to be the way that the player was looking otherwise it's quite jarring especially in vr so we'll get the player's actor rotation so we'll get actor rotation and we will plug that into the destination rotation just so that when the player ends up on the pad they're not looking in some random direction which can be really really off-putting in VR. So with that done the other thing we want is our uh, static mesh again so we can use our static mesh we will place the cube in here and I think what I want to do is I'm just going to set the z-axis down to like 0.1 just so it's a, a pad of some sort place this on the floor somewhere in the corner we'll come back in so now we'll see that if I can get the camera to go around to the cube, that one rotates. And if I can get it to go around to the pad, this is like a new game in itself. We should teleport, there we go, onto the pad. So this is the teleportation working. And of course, if you add a few of these around the map now, you have a teleportation system for VR systems like mobile devices, which might not have a motion controller available. So you can have that kind of gaze-based interactivity with your game. Now, like I mentioned, this is very, very simple. This is an instantaneous kind of jolting uh, movement, especially if you've got multiple teleportation pads. You're not really giving any sign what's happening, but this is a quick way to get that working. And in the next video, I will be going through how to set this up with a timer, making a widget that will allow you to count down how long you've got left until that thing's going to happen. So it's just a little bit less of a shock to the player. But this is at the very least working. And of course, I uh, need to remember to turn off the ray trace because that kind of looks a little bit odd as well. So I'll turn this back to none. For now though, I'm going to leave that video here. As always, if you've enjoyed the video or found it useful, then please do leave a like and share the video around. That always helps. To be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and apparently the bell notification uh, might send you in the right direction. As always though, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.